Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 will be my first scripture. And then my second scripture will be 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. So let me have the first one. He said, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Hallelujah. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Please keep that at the back of your mind. Don't mind however the gift came. Just the emphasis is neglect not the gift that is in you. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. Sorry, verse 6. I beg your pardon. He says, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou steer up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now the first one says neglect not the gift. Now without revelating, without trying to be deep and high sounding it automatically suggests that the gift can be neglected, abandoned, made of no effect, but it is still the gift. Am I correct? Am I correct? So there can be a gift, but it is neglected, abandoned, without effect. What, how not to neglect that gift, therefore, is his admonition in the 6 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Steer up the gift of God that is in thee. Without any trying to give meaning to it. The gift of God in you is not automatically active. Should I take that to be one of the interpretations of that scripture? Steer it up, he says. Steer it up. We all know, especially our, our sisters, know how to steer things. Those people that cook, you know how to steer. And in stirring, you can help something to be fine-tuned. Am I correct? In the Greek, the word that was used there can literally mean fan to flame. One of the ways that we don't neglect the gifts of God is that we stay it up. Praise God. I want to use this uh, understanding, therefore, to um, take us a step further in our journey in the anointing of the Spirit on the subject activating the anointing. Because it is not automatically active just because it's available. And this part of um, our journey this month is automatically suggesting that you already have the anointing. Or at least you know how to get the anointing. But let's take it that the anointing is available. God has supplied it. It is called the gift of God. I believe that one of the things we can categorize as the gifts of God to us, to humankind, to enable us function, because that's what the gift of God does. It enables us to function effectively in the will of God for our lives. It enables us to function effectively in our purposes. If anything is the gift of God, I believe the anointing is one. Nothing makes a man function effectively in the will of God for their lives, for their existence, like the anointing. It's a power tool. Hallelujah. Upon the life of a believer. If that is the case this morning, the Spirit of God is saying in these two scriptures, number one, 
it can be neglected. And we know that from scripture. That there are men that neglected the anointing of God. And when it was time for the anointing to do what the anointing is supposed to do, the anointing was not operative. Example is Saul. Saul died the death of a man that is like he was not anointed. Now I'm taking that literally from the lamentation of David over Saul. He said he fell as though he was not anointed. So he was anointed. So what happened there is the fact that the anointing was not operative. And one of the things that make the anointing to become that dormant, because you and I know that Saul was anointed, but he fell as though he was not anointed. So what happened there? One of the things that can make the anointing of God, even though available to us, to become dormant, ineffective, inoperative, is neglecting it. Paul said, can be neglected. If it can be neglected, then there must be, therefore, ways to attend to it. There must be ways to, in the words of Paul, stir it up. I chose the word activate it. The anointing can be activated. If the anointing is going to deliver, it does not deliver automatically because of availability. It has to be activated. Now, I'm taking activation this morning to be mobilized into operation. My meaning of activating it this morning is mobilizing it into operation. So it is one thing for you to have the anointing or to have access and anointing. It is another thing for that anointing to be effective. To be in operation. Activation is the mobilization of the anointing into operation. The mobilization of the anointing into operation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never forget it can be dormant. In the case of Saul, the anointing assumed a dormant position. And so, one of the, the, the workings of the anointing is the defense of the anointed. Am I correct? Yeah. One of the workings of the anointing. In fact, the psalmist puts it this way. He rebuked them saying, touch not mine anointed. One of the operations of the anointing is the defense of the anointed. Now here was Saul. He was hit by a bullet. You, you, don't, need, you don't want to know the kind of bullet that hit Saul. The Bible describes it in a very funny way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I won't talk about that now. So the anointing of God on his life was in a dormant state. So much so that when it was time for the anointing to come to his defense, it was not operational. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the anointing of God that you have been able to access will be permanently active upon your life. I thought you would say amen to that. Yeah. I thought you would say amen to that. Yeah. In the name of Jesus Christ. So anywhere you see the anointing of God helping a man, it is not automatic. That man cooperated by keeping it operational. That man cooperated by keeping the anointing activated. The anointing can do wonders in your life. It can make your life become easier in one area or the other. That's what the anointing is for. It can bring speed to your life. The anointing can bring, like I said, ease. But child of God, for the anointing to deliver its, 
intended result. There's a role of activation that every man must get involved with. If you ever see it working, Saul's own failed. There was an anointing failure. It wasn't the anointing itself that failed. It was the state that he left his anointing that was the problem. His anointing was neglected. It was not activated. So he failed. It wasn't the anointing that failed. It was Saul that failed in his responsibility. You may want to think about Samson as well. And it can go on and on. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anointing can be put in a state of walking where it is now walking. If you see it walking, somebody had something to do with it. And that is the person that carries it. He mobilized it to walk. That mobilization is what I am calling activation today. You will not carry anointing and die like a man without an anointing. And labor like a man without an anointing. And suffer like a man without an anointing. Are you with me still? This anointing you carry that doesn't seem like anything in its full operation can terrify your adversaries. In its full operation. I am saying you are anointed. But we have to keep it active. It is like the umbrella. The umbrella is a beautiful thing, even though I don't know how to use it. Amazingly. I have never known how to use the umbrella. In fact, when I carry umbrella, it's when rain beat me the most. I don't know why. Maybe I, I'm not very conscious of holding it properly. But the anointing is like the umbrella. It's a beautiful equipment. It can help you. It can, it can, it can for our, our sisters, it can actually um, protect your hair just on emergency, at emergency level. But the fact that you have an umbrella does not mean that either the rain or the sun will not happen to you. Are you with me? Yes, everybody can just see that as very simple. The fact that an umbrella is with you hmm, does not automatically <laughs> progress into the protection that the umbrella can offer. Am I correct? So, that process of punching a button to the side that you did is the activation we are talking about. For the umbrella to serve its purpose, you must activate it. It is like you, are, you, you have a parachute and then you are falling from a height. God forbid. Yeah? Let's, let it be a deliberate falling like these this ones that, you know, when, when you eat too much, you can just start playing nonsense play. I saw a guy one day went to the edge of space. The edge of space. They took him to the edge of space because he's a skydiver. Skydiver. Like seriously. They took him to the edge of space and that was where he jumped off the aircraft from. From the edge of space. He was way away from our atmosphere. Way. He was away from our atmosphere. Well, we thank God he, he, he landed safely. Uh, with the aid of a parachute, eventually he... Um, activated the parachute, and then he landed safely. And this boy came out to be telling us that his mother warned him not to go. His mother was crying when he was going. But thank God he landed safely. But imagine that he had that parachute on him. Good working condition. He still had a responsibility. True, yes. He still, I'm just trying to make this thing as simple as possible. He still had a responsibility. That's how the anointing operates. The fact that God called you and anointed you does not mean that the anointing automatically operates. It has to be mobilized. And there are actions of faith that mobilize your anointing into operation. 
That's what this sermon is about. There are actions, there are steps, there are protocols that mobilize your anointing. It may not mobilize for another person's own, but at least your own will come alive. It's like that process of you now eventually knowing that you now have the need to use the parachute. Then you use it. You may have it, but nobody can make it save you. You are the only one that can make it save you. Am I correct? Yeah. That's how the anointing works. That's why Saul was anointed. He failed like an unanointed man. The difference between David and Saul is in this activation. David was a man giving to the mobilization of the gift that God gave him. I'm putting it to work. So that when you, I'm preaching this message. So that when you go back to business tomorrow. So that when you go back to life tomorrow. You will not be operating outside of the anointing. You will not be operating without the help of the anointing. The anointing is available to help you do better. That's what it's available for. To help you do better. Do better. I pray in the name of Jesus. As you go back to the week. You will do better. Amen. Let me hear that amen now. Amen. Let me hear that amen. amen. I say you will do better. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. There are a few things I just want to give you quickly that keep your anointing in the active position. That removes it from a dormant position. I'm not giving them in any particular order, so don't think that it's, it must follow this protocol or this lineup, as it were. But each of these is key, and you must engage. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor, say engage. Number one is spiritual hunger. If you sustain spiritual hunger, what you are doing without knowing is keeping the anointing of God on your life in an operative state. You are keeping the anointing of God on your life in an operative state. There's a law of operating the anointing of the supernatural called hunger. A hunger for God. You may use the word desire First, it's all good. It's fine. Hallelujah. You must sustain a heart condition that maintains hunger for God. It's a basic protocol that you cannot do without. In fact, all the other protocols may not even come to play where there is no hunger. That's why hunger is very key. You must sustain a hunger for God, a thirst, a yearning, a longing. The way the, the psalmist puts it, I think in Psalm 63, Oh Lord, you are my God, my soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longs for thee. And then, if you go down, he says, to see your power and your glory. Did you, did, can, yeah, let's, just, let's, just, let's just read that scripture. Put us on verse 1. Let's start it from where it is. He said, Oh God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh does what? Long. This is, this is a state of hunger. Spiritual hunger. Spiritual hunger. Longed for thee. Give me the scripture please. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Now look at the next verse. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. You see the connection there? You see the connection there? Hungry men see the power of God in action. Are you here? Are you here? God is always powerful. But it takes men of hunger, spiritual hunger, to see that power. Are you here? Hunger mobilizes his power. He mobilizes his power. 
hunger. Hunger for his presence. Hunger for his, his person. Is a strategy for the mobilization of the power of the almighty God. It's almost automatic for hungry men to be, to be powerful men. It's almost automatic. And it's almost automatic to see people who have no hunger. There is no, no yearning in their soul for God and the things of God and their gaze is not accurately on God and the things of the supernatural. Those people, it's almost automatic for them to walk as though there is, as if God is weak. Are you with me? Anything that drains your spiritual hunger wants to take your anointing back to a dormant state. You are anointing for whatever it is. You are anointing to heal the sick. You are anointing to, to, to build institutions because some of you, that's the anointing you carry. Am I correct? You are anointing for administration because there are people who are called to administration. It's, no, it's not just jumping into politics. There are people who are called into leadership. As was Daniel of old. Praise God. Daniel was a politician. He was active in government. He was helped by the spirit of God. And even his generation knew that he was helped by God. That's what the anointing is. The anointing is the help of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are going to sustain an active movement of this dimension, you must sustain hunger. Anything that, that drains your soul of this, this spiritual hunger that David was talking about, anything that drains your soul of it, when you are coming to a place where you are losing hunger for God, other things other, other appetites have, have grown over time. Out, outgrown the appetite for God. You know what is happening? It's shutting down your anointing. Shutting down your anointing. That was part of the reason why Saul's anointing went down. That was the reason why Samson's anointing disappeared at some point. You remember Samson's anointing disappeared? You know one thing you will never read about in Samson? You will never, you can never associate something with relationship with God. You can't. You won't find it anywhere. In fact, there's no record that Samson never prayed. Only once when he was hungry. He's a man that had no passion for God. Even though God gave him an anointing. After a while, that anointing shut down. May anointing not shut down. You see these things that come to replace your hunger for God. I'm telling you what their mission is. is to shut down this power of God that can give you an edge. Shut it down. Shut it down. Listen, spiritual men say the lack of spiritual hunger is a spiritual emergency. When you get to a point, it's an emergency on every front. Tap your neighbor. Tell them this sleep will not help you now. I'm talking to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are sleeping at this time, it, your, your anointing has really, has really gone down. May God bring it up in Jesus' name. I say may God bring it up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I'm saying, does it make sense so far now? Is it making sense now? Yes, that's the reality. Show me a man that is moving powerfully in the anointing of the spirit. I will show you a hungry man. A man that has kept spiritual hunger high and above every other hunger. That's why they do some of the things they do. Which are some of the things I'll mention now. As I continue. Praise God. If you have lost your hunger as you proceed this way, start looking for it. And make sure you find it and keep it close. That's what some of us do. When we notice that other appetites are trying to grow because of life must happen to you. I don't care how spiritual you are. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Life is, dest 
is designed to put pressure to the extent that your spiritual now takes the back seat and which is which is a mistake when your spiritual takes the back seat because you live out of your spiritual you don't live out of your physical are you with me oh nobody's hearing what i'm saying no no matter how hard you try your physical cannot sustain you it is your spiritual that sustains you it is the spirit of a man that sustains his infirmity but you know what the pressures of life does is so that it can switch your appetites. You get to a point where your work, your business, your other activities now takes the front seat. Now something is already going wrong because even the help you need for those things to succeed, you are losing that help already. You are already losing that help. If you think that life can be lived just out of natural resources alone. It's a joke. And a dangerous one. Because it can kill. Some of us have to deliberately. You know how you take multivitamins sometimes. To help induce appetite. I don't know whether it's medically right or wrong. But I, I, well, I think it should be right. You, people take multivitamins to induce uh, appetite. Am I correct? That is what I'm talking about. Spiritually, you should induce hunger. Learn to induce hunger. Whenever you find that your hunger for, for the supernatural, for God, for his person, his presence, for his reality, is going down above your hunger for success. You know this thing we call success. What we call success in Nigeria is a dangerous thing. Before anybody will tell you about success, tell them to define it for you very well. Because many times what they just call success is you just being better than another person. Many times, that's what they mean. Just be better than another person. Even whether, whether you are that person on the same lane or not. So you just look around, okay, I'm better than this person. Praise God, I'm successful. It's a lie, you. Success is when you are at your best in the center of the will of God for you. It's not just when you are better than somebody else. So there's African success and there's good success. May God deliver us from African success. Yeah. African success puts you under pressure to buy a cloth because somebody else bought it. That's African success. You change your car because somebody changed their car. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If car is not your priority now, don't change your car because somebody changed car just to look successful. Because that's not success. It's been your best in the center of God's will. So it is not a destination. It's a journey. It's a journey. But African success is a destination. Once my house is taller than everybody's house in the neighborhood, I'm, a, I'm the most successful person in the neighborhood. That thing can drive you to an early grave. I'm telling you. Praise God. No wonder, uh, what's the guy's name? Joshua. Talked about good success. You, have you ever had good success? There's good and bad success. Some, most of the things we call success in Nigeria, including in church, so-called success, I'm telling you, it's not good success. It's not good success. Success that you are in and you have, you have violated every rule. It's not success. May God help us. I say may God help us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let me not lose my point. Keep your hunger alive and your anointing will stay afloat keep your hunger I told you that you can induce it it can be induced some of us are able to sustain because we have learned how to induce hunger spiritual hunger we have learned how to eat spiritual multivitamins and stay hungry because life will happen to you as life happens one of the first thing that will go is this thing we're talking about. I'm not saying you will not go to church again. I'm not even saying you will not pray again. You can be praying and carrying out all religious activities in emotion, yet you have no hunger at all. Yeah. So don't mix the two. I'm not saying you are backsliding, but you are no longer as desperate for God the way you should. 
there's a way you should be desperate for God. More than any kind of achievement, there's a way. There's a way. Thank God for every kind of achievement. But I'm telling you, I'm not putting achievements down. I'm telling you, there's an easier way to get at it. There's the help of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh, well, there's nothing as beautiful as when God helps a man. When he arrives, he's not all beaten. Eh? When he's all about his effort, his flesh, when he arrives, he may arrive, but he will be all beaten. And he would have beaten everybody along the way. Hallelujah. But when God helps a man, when he arrives, you arrive fresh. You will arrive fresh. You arrive fresh. In the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, stay hungry. No, you, you need to say it the way they'll get it. Say, stop sleeping and stay hungry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know what messages like this do? It's trying to induce hunger in you. Yeah. That's what it's trying to do. Because... You will not, you see, as long as you live, life happens, sir. Life happens to all of us. There's a way school fees matters who hit you, hit you, hit you, hit you. The only thing that's a priority is school fees. And God takes, are you, am I the only one this happened to? There's a way house rent hit you, hit you, hit you, hit you. Amen. Every other thing is second to house rent, correct? Yeah. So it happens to all of us. That's why I say it's called a fight of faith. You see, faith is a fight. For you to maintain faith is a fight. It takes a fight. And you must be determined to fight. Hallelujah. Don't just chicken out because life happens. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. I've told you many times in this church how to induce hunger. How to induce hunger. You can induce hunger. It's like taking spiritual vitamins and you become hungry. I know there are books I read that just, I, I, it makes me uncomfortable with my current state. Are you with me? Yes. There are, there are messages I hear that makes me uncomfortable with my current state. And just the same way that hunger can be induced, hunger can be killed. By your activities, you can kill your hunger. Even the little one that you, you are still working with, you can kill it finally. A Christian who spends the whole week feeding his soul with all kinds of carnality, all kinds of irrelevant, nonsensical things, all kinds of TV series, movies of every kind, names withheld, and all of that, spend hours on social media reading and commenting can never wake up the next day with spiritual hunger no there are not two ways about it and that's the reason why the devil puts all those things out there but many Christians do not know I can assure you that if you spend a fraction of the time that you spend on social media on feeding your spirit you'll be more hungry than this it's not, there's no magic about it. It's very simple and straight to the point. The next thing you need to do, if you get hungry, these things will just naturally begin to follow. The next thing is communion. I didn't say prayer. I didn't say prayer. Prayer is good. Prayer is awesome. But I say communion with the Holy Spirit. Your time with the Spirit of God just emptying yourself before him and getting filled by him is very key to keeping the anointing of God on your life fresh and mobilized. Your time, your time. See, Paul the apostles called something the communion of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever read that in the Bible? You know, we use it in our benediction in church, but I tell you the truth, that is more than benediction. Your time spent with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is the one that Jesus sent after he left to come and help you. When was the last time you have had time with him? A lot of Christians do not know that what the physical presence of Jesus, listen to this, this may help somebody, listen to this. I learned this. What the physical presence of Jesus 
was to the disciples. Did you know that when Jesus said, I will send another comforter? Huh? You are not hearing me, eh? Oh. When Jesus said, I'll send another comforter. Now, another means there was one before. Hello? Oh, God. I will send another what? That means there, there is one before. Do you know who that one was? Or that one is? Okay, it's Jesus. He was talking to a specific audience. In the interpretation of Bible, there are certain things you follow. To whom was he speaking? When, how, and all of that. He was talking to a particular group of people. Yes, I know he was speaking to the whole world, the church and all that. But he, was primary, he had a primary audience. Am I correct? So who was the primary audience here? The disciples. They have known him as a comforter. So he now told them, I will send you another comforter. So I'm trying to say that what Jesus' physical presence meant to the disciples, and I'm sure you know what it meant. Only if you just look around and see the things they did. When they had any little challenge, what did they do? They went to Jesus. When they had need to pay tax and they had no money, they went to Jesus. When they wanted to learn how to pray, they went to Jesus. Am I, am I, huh? Yeah. He was the comforter that they had. Now, when he wanted to go, they were not comfortable with it. In fact, they said, no, you are going nowhere. We die here. We die here. Amen. Well, you are going nowhere. That's what they said. Then he now encouraged them. Say, listen, I, when I go, I will send you another comforter. There's a replacement. A, one of a different, one of the same of a different kind. So Jesus was their comforter. The Holy Ghost was now going to be another comforter for them. Their fear was all the benefits and the advantages that they had with the physical presence of Jesus, they were about to lose. And they didn't want that. Who want to lose that kind of insurance? Anytime you are broke, you say, Master, I'm broke. He say, okay, take. Right? So in their panic, Jesus said, there's another. Oh. Now, this explanation should ask you a question. Are you seeing the Holy Spirit? The way the disciples saw Jesus? For the most part, the answer is no. Yeah. For the most part, for, for the most part of the average Christian, the answer is no. But Jesus in, actually intended that as he was with the disciples, huh, where they could have a conversation, where they could engage and, and talk about issues and resolve issues together. Did you know that that's how the early church took the Holy Spirit? I can show you from the scripture. In fact, one of their statements one time was, it pleased the Holy Ghost and us. Did you ever read that statement as of the apostle? They were talking about an issue. Oh, they were trying to talk about an issue. Then they said, the answer to that is, it pleased the Holy Ghost and us. Do you know the level of communion that will make a man to, to, to actually know the opinion of the Holy Ghost on the matter? Do we both agree, me and the Holy Ghost, we agree on this matter that this is the way to go. Oh God, nobody's hearing what I'm saying. We agree that this is, so they actually took the Holy Spirit the same way they took Jesus. Unfortunately for the most Christian, the Holy Spirit is just one little spirit like that or is, um, is, is one small God like that or is um, so many things. Or is, is a breeze, is power. The Holy Spirit is not breeze, it's not power. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. Ooh. <laughs> In the Old Testament, he came to them as Yahweh Adonai. Of course, that was very hard to handle. Because, <laughs> let me not go there. In the Gospels, he came to them as Yeshua HaMashiach. That was highly consumable. You could relate. Huh? 
in the church, that is the age you belong to, he now came back as Ruach HaKodesh. Same God, different forms of manifestation. That's the meaning of the Trinity. It's one person, but manifested in different forms. It's not two persons. Every attribute that was used for God the Father and God the Son was used for the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus called him Father. That is the Holy Spirit. Oh, nobody's hearing what I'm saying. But a lot of believers do not see him as a person. They don't see him as God enough. When they said it pleased us and the Holy Ghost. Do you know what that means? There was a reasoning together. When was the last time you reasoned with the Holy Spirit? They reasoned together. So they knew how to reason with him. He pleased us and the Holy Ghost. We have discussed this matter and this is our position. We and the Holy Ghost. What a partnership. What a sweet communion. This is what is missing. In charismatic Christianity today. Hallelujah. Many people do not see the Holy Spirit as God enough. Who is God? Is God? Is God the Father? He is God the Son. That's who He is. Are you with me now? He's God the Father. He's, he's God. Just read the scripture. He's God. Okay, let's take you, your spirit. Hmm? Your, you, you know your spirit can separate from your body. Huh? Hello? And when your spirit separates from your body, you, anybody that know you, when they see that, that your spirit, they will know it's, your, it's you. Hope you know that. Because this is your physical form. It's your spirit that gave this form. So if I see your spirit, I'll know it, this, is, this, is, this is him now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hmm. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father. You are you. You are your spirit and your spirit is you. Am I correct? Because it's same essence, same everything. Same attributes, same characteristics. So in the scripture, there was no, no adjective that was used to qualify the Father, no characteristic that was used to describe the Father that was not used for the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, I will send another comforter. I, I have comforted you enough. I need to go. Somebody else will come and take my place and do it just like me. Oh, if you know how Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit. He said, I will never leave you comfortless. Hmm? He said, I will go. And I will come to you again. Do you understand that? Do you know what? Do you know the meaning of that statement? I will go and I'll come to you again. When he was talking about this comforter guy, uh, person, huh? He was talking about himself. I will never leave you. I will go. How is he with you now? He's with you as the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? It is Jesus without the body. That's all. Just see him that way. Is Jesus Christ without the flesh body because he doesn't need it for now. He needed it just to walk on the earth. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. When he had the body, there was a limitation because he couldn't be in all places at the same time. He took that limitation temporarily because it was needed to rescue you. But God should not be limited. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That was a temporary decision he took. Just to, now he has gone back to his original form. That is the Holy Spirit. Somebody asks, how do I relate with the Holy Spirit? The same way the disciples related with the Holy Spirit. That's how. With Jesus, sorry. That's how. Just the same way. So in the communion of the Spirit, it's beyond just bashing God with prayer points. Attacking God with prayer. It's beyond that. It's actually a meaningful relationship. Having a relationship. Engaging. Praise God. In a relationship, it's not every time that there's a need, right? But communion goes on. That's what you should sustain with the Holy Spirit. You will thank me if you learn how to do this because the more you do it, the more the Spirit, the, 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 the presence of God in your life strengthens and is active. Paul say the communion of the Holy Spirit be with how many people? How many people? Talk to me. With you all. Not some of us. 
not Benny Hinn, not Catherine Kuhlman. With you all. Sometimes I want to remind myself about the Holy Spirit like that. In that, this kind of deep, intimate relationship. I just go and listen to Catherine Coleman talk about him. Oh. She talked about him like he's somebody that lives next door. And she knows the person. And knows the feelings and the emotions of the person. Such an intimate relationship she had with the Holy Spirit. No wonder she was so powerful. Catherine Coleman. My God. So powerful. Her secret was her communion with the Holy Spirit. That koinonia, that fellowship, that partnership, that participation, that taking the Holy Spirit like a body, like a friend that you are with all the time. The beautiful thing is, he can be always with you. Always. Do you know why he feels sometimes like he's not there? It's not because it, it, it's not necessarily that he's not there. It's that you didn't acknowledge him. And when you don't acknowledge him, you know what he does? He will act as if he is not there. Because you ignored him. We ignore him most of the time. Praise God. We ignore him most of the time. That sweet communion. When you keep it vibrant, when you keep it alive, which is something you can do without necessarily being in any particular spiritual posture. You can actually have a conversation with the Holy Spirit just that easy. It begins with simple talk, like pet talk, just talk. Amen. How did this start for Benny Hinn? He went to a Catherine Coleman meeting, came out the next morning after fellowship with the Holy Spirit the previous night, woke up the next morning. The first thing that came to his mind to say was, Good morning, Holy Spirit. You remember that book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit? If you haven't read it before, and you're a member of this church, you deserve three strokes of cane. If you're a member of this church, and you have never read Good Morning, Holy Spirit, you deserve how many strokes? Three strokes. Come and get it after service. You have to read it. It's a manual in this church. Good morning, Holy Spirit. That was how Benny Hinn's relationship with the Holy Spirit began. Because that day, the moment he said it, he showed up. He revealed his presence. Wow. This thing progressed into days and weeks and months of intimate koinonia. And that went on through most part of his youth life until he came into ministry and he hosted such a presence and the power of God. The more he fellowship with him. Hallelujah. Make room for the Holy Spirit. Do it deliberately. Listen, when you start it, it may not look like there's anything. No. Let me be honest with you. But you know what? If you continue. You know, this, the problem with the spirit world is they don't view the things, we, they don't see things like we see. No spirit takes you serious because you did something once. When you start a spiritual journey, the spirit world will just be looking at you because they know man. They know it may just be a soulish activity. Like you just heard the sermon now. Somebody may wake up tomorrow morning and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Feels nothing. Anyway, I try. <laughs> Hallelujah. Does it make sense so far? Oh, this is the communion that keeps you alive. Alive. When you come out of that place, you come, you come with heaven going with you. Yesterday, I came out of such a communion. Huh? I came out of such a communion over the night. I had spent, you know, hours in the night from before 12 midnight all till, up till after 5 a.m. I was just there in that fellowship, in intimate fellowship and prayer. From there, I had two hours sleep. Two hours, 20-something minutes sleep. So about seven something. And then I came straight from there to a meeting in church. How many of you were at that meeting? Huh? Yeah, I came straight to a meeting in church, the meeting of the intercessory team. Now, now the people that lifted their hand, now go ask them, how was that meeting? I didn't have to say much. The one I've been with for five hours followed me to the place. And the room was filled with his presence. Anybody that was there knew that the Holy Ghost came. When you spend time with him, he follows you out. That's what is called the anointing. 
We, I didn't lay hands on anybody. The Holy Ghost was touching the people by himself. In fact, all of them were in the anointing. When I left, they didn't even know. I disappeared. I just vaporized. I was gone. When they recovered from the spirit, they didn't see me again. <laughs> because I needed to go cast some rest myself. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful thing I'm talking about. You cannot journey this way and not be anointed powerfully to do whatever that God has ordained you to do. Does that make sense to anybody today? I'm charging you. Listen, don't go try it tomorrow morning and nothing happens. I say, okay, fine, I've tried this one. So what's the next, what's the next one? That's where Christians lose. When it has to do with the spirit, eh? you need to convince the spirit that you mean business. So the spirit waits on you, like waits. The Holy Spirit will be there. You say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Be looking at, is, it, is it not you? So that I'll come and commit myself to you. Now, tomorrow morning, you have changed to another thing. So they watch you for a while. I'm telling you. But after a while, when the Spirit finds that you mean business, he'll come and join you in this fellowship. Does this make sense to anybody? This is how I pray. Sometimes I go to pray. I spend a whole hour just talking to the Holy Spirit. Just, just asking him questions and asking him to do things in my life. To, to I'm opening up myself to him and inviting. After a while, the environment becomes charged. At that time, even prayer is no longer at your will. Like, I want to pray for this Lord. It becomes a flow. When the Spirit helps you, the anointing is a flow. Life is a flow. When the Spirit helps you to do anything, it's a flow. It's not a, it's not a, listen, you will walk, yes. But there's a way you walk and you know this is grace. Yeah. You know this is grace. I pray somebody learned something this morning. Engage the Holy Spirit. Pray, yes, but please commune with the Holy Spirit. Stop ignoring him. He is with you like Jesus was with the disciples. Just begin by acknowledging him. Just begin by letting him know you know he's here. Are you with me? Let him know that you are aware. Ask him basic help. He's your helper, am I correct? Housewife, you are looking for your, your, your children's shoe. You have searched everywhere. You can't find it. Practice from there. Holy Spirit, please, where is this shoe? Help me find it. Oh, did you hear what I said now? He's your helper. You are, you are preparing for an exam. Holy Spirit, please show me. Where do I focus on? Where do I concentrate? Start with basic life. That was how the disciples walked with Jesus. It's not until there are spiritual matters. Just start with basic everyday life. Sometimes just make fun of it with it as in exercise with it. Holy Spirit, please, where is this key? Show me. Where is this book? Show me. Where is this? Show me. Where is this my trouser? Hello. Is that much there to help like that? How much help we ignore when we ignore the Holy Spirit? Have you ever looked for something before you say, Holy Spirit, please, where is this? And you find it immediately. Yeah. Many Christians have practiced that. You find it like almost, yeah, you find it is amazing. Just start simple. Ask him simple questions. Ask him to fill you every day. Sometimes, just go and sit down. Holy Spirit, come and touch me. I want your touch. And wait on him. If he doesn't seem like he's coming, stay there. Ask him again. Ask him again. Ask him again. You are going to, 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 to do something. It's a project. Ask the Holy Spirit for help. Ask him, Holy Spirit, how do I solve this problem? How do I address this thing? What do I say to this person? Start with that basic thing. That's what the communion is about. It's a fellowship. It's a partnership. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Make him your partner. That is what I'm talking about. Make the Holy Spirit your partner. He wants to be your partner. That's the meaning, one of the meaning of koinonia. One of the meaning of koinonia is partnership. Can you imagine? The Holy Spirit wants to be your partner. And many of us, we ignore him. We act like he doesn't exist, but he does. He doesn't just exist, his existence. His existence. Yeah. Everyone needs the Holy Spirit. Children. You know, teach your children when they sit for exams. Holy Spirit, please help me. When they study for exams, Holy Spirit, help me. Teach your children. Teach everybody around you. 
and you are going to come into a reality of the power of God that you, you, you even you yourself cannot believe. Are you, are you here with me? Yeah. Does this sound real to anybody this morning? My time is up, but I just pray that it made sense to you. Did it make sense? Start, practice. Do, what did I say? I hope you know that spiritual things can be practiced. All things can be practiced, including spiritual things. You can exercise in the spirit. Exercise with it. Exercise with basic things. All basic life challenges, realities, difficulties. Exercise with it. Ask questions. Somebody is trying to convince you about who they are. Ask the Holy Spirit, who is this person? The Holy Spirit, who is this person? Who is she? Who is he? Somebody trying to tell you, I'm like this, I'm like that. Let the Holy Spirit tell you. Start with those basic things. And it will get richer and richer and richer. But if you never start, because you tried it the first day and it looks quiet, you will never grow in it. Stand to your feet now.